Queenie, thank you so much for joining Hello us. There. I'm so happy to see you, especially after this trying to connect, trying to <laughs> fix things. Yes. Uh, I hope you are, are having a good day and I'm definitely excited and, and happy that you are here with us tonight. How are you feeling? Yes, for sure. I'm very, very happy to be amongst your company. And I think we have a very interesting topic to discuss today. Really That's excited for sure. about it. That's for sure. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. And let me just mention Dr. Fataini, fertility specialist at uh, Assisting Nature. And she is located in Thessaloniki right now. Um, mm -hmm. Beautiful weather, I'm sure. So I'm glad that you are connecting um, with us tonight. So thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, we definitely want to get going with our topic as we will talk about freezing works indications when to consider it and uh, how it's done so all of this will be discussed today but of course remember there will be time for your questions so if you have any you can type those in the chat dr fotaini shuliara i'm sure she'll be happy to explain everything and help you out with any questions that you might have uh, so feel free to to do so right after the presentation or during the presentation and right now let's get going with our topic are you ready? Excellent. I'm ready if you are. <laughs> Let's get going then. Thank you so okay. much indeed. Excellent, excellent. So um, let's get started. Uh, we're going to be talking about egg freezing and uh, what are the benefits of egg freezing and when to consider it. Um, all right. Okay. So first of all, what is egg freezing? Egg freezing is basically the process of preserving a woman's eggs in order to delay having a baby for later on in her life. How is it done? I mean, oh, okay. Um, the whole, all of the pictures appeared at once. It's okay. Uh, so egg freezing is the far, first part of an IVF treatment, really. So the first part would be to take a meticulous medical history to do all the necessary blood workup. Um, and evaluate the woman's reproductive potential and choose the appropriate stimulation protocol for her. Um, of course, it involves the administration of uh, daily subcutaneous injections. These are the so-called gonadotrophins. They can be either FSH preparations or a mixture of FSH and LH. Now, the protocol that we usually use uh, for egg freezing is that of the classical antagonist, the short protocol. It usually uh, starts on the second day of your period. Uh, again, we've got the daily administration of uh, the gonadotrophins. Usually on day six, we've got the addition of uh, the antagonist, which prevents uh, any follicles from rupturing prematurely. And around day 10, our follicles are ready for the final triggering shot, uh, which is the shot that actually matures uh, the oocytes. Uh, 36 hours later, we are ready for the oocyte pickup. Uh, this is a minor gynecological surgery. Um, it usually takes um, around 10 to 30 minutes to be completed, depending on the number of follicles that we have to aspirate. And it's usually done under some form of sedation, uh, some form of anesthesia, usually sedation. Now, the oocytes, the eggs that are retrieved, are taken to the lab. The embryologist will examine them under the microscope. And of course, they will um, wash them and strip them of their associated um, cumulus cells. And they will uh, actually recognize those eggs that are mature. They are M2 oocytes. Only M2 oocytes are suitable for freezing. Now, uh, once the eggs are frozen, I mean, theoretically, they can be kept in that state forever. In Greece, uh, we have recently had um, an increase in the time that we can keep the eggs frozen from 10 up to 20 years. So it's plenty of time to utilize them in the future if you have to. Now, when do you need them? Uh, I mean, if uh, you cannot get pregnant spontaneously, naturally with your partner or husband uh, or through uh, insemination with donor sperm, you know that you can actually use your eggs this means that uh, the, the first uh, part would be to thaw the eggs, then fertilize them via ICSI, intracytoplasmic uh, sperm injection. Uh, then the embryos will be cultured 
and uh, transferred into the womb, which completes um, the, the whole process. Now, hopefully, by the end of this process, uh, we will be able to have more than one uh, embryos. Uh, of course, by transferring more embryos, we increase our success rates and uh, we increase our chances of getting pregnant sooner. However, we should always keep in mind that single embryo transfer is safer as um, it helps to, uh, it, it, it protects us um, against uh, higher order pregnancies and all the associated obstetrical uh, difficulties associated with them. Of course, any surplus embryos uh, that we have, we can freeze them and use them at a later point in our life. Okay. Um, so, who can actually use egg freezing? Who is it for? Now, so far, egg freezing uh, was uh, offered to women who were faced with cancer. Uh, these women had to go through radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, treatments that could actually um, affect their future fertility. Uh, of course, nowadays things have changed and we can actually offer egg uh, freezing to women uh, for either medical or social reasons. Okay, uh, so uh, let's elaborate uh, on this a little bit more uh, and see the, you, you know, who this uh, method, this procedure can be useful to. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, of course, women who will have to undergo a gonadotoxic therapy, either for cancer or for another illness, such as, for example, lupus, uh, might benefit from freezing their eggs, as this will enable them to preserve their fertility uh, in the future. Um, women with primary ovarian insufficiency uh, with fragile X syndrome or Turner syndrome could also benefit. Um, uh, women who go through ovarian stimulation and have produced a, a large number of eggs might opt to freeze some of them instead of uh, fertilizing all of them with their husband's sperm. Um, and could, it could also help us to get out of a difficult situation, uh, as in having done the oocyte pickup, but having been unable to obtain any sperm. So in these circumstances, we can opt to freeze the eggs um, and fertilize them later on um, with the husband's or partner's sperm or with donor sperm. Um, we shouldn't really forget the, the couples who, uh, because of their religious beliefs, um, might uh, not want to have um, many embryos kept frozen. Um, and in that case, we can um, instead of throwing these eggs away, we can keep them frozen and maybe fertilize them or dispose of them in the future. And of course, um, uh, we are living in a very fluid uh, society um, and a person might decide to transition from being female to male, but still uh, they might want to preserve uh, their ability to have a genetically linked to them offspring uh, in the future. So most of these reasons are basically medical reasons, but we can see that nowadays uh, there is a very big, uh, the very, there is a very big group of women uh, who actually by choice delay having a baby for later on in their lives. Uh, women who want to pursue their careers or their studies uh, because they want to feel uh, more financially stable before starting a family, uh, or because at the moment they do not have, uh, they're not in a, a stable, fulfilling uh, relationship. Um, uh, so these women might choose to delay having a baby, uh, but are faced with the risk of having infertility issues themselves. So they, they run the risk of having a difficulty conceiving when they do decide to go ahead with having a baby, uh, they are faced with increased chances of having a baby with a chromosomal abnormality uh, and they have their, they run the risk of having um, uh, increased um, chance of having pregnancy loss in the future. Now for this group of women, egg freezing could actually give them the choice uh, of preserving um, 
their potential of having a baby of their own genetic um, contribution in the future. Uh, and it can also allow them uh, to do so while going ahead with their own uh, personal uh, life plan. So that's quite important. Um, and of course, I mean, life is very unpredictable. Um, you might be in a um, loving, stable relationship. You might undergo IVF and have your embryos frozen. Uh, but unfortunately, your partner might decide to withdraw consent. So as um, a safeguard, you can uh, always have uh, some of your eggs frozen um, in order to use them uh, later on if you wish to. If something um, like that happens, if such a problem arises, um, and uh, having some eggs aside might also be helpful if, you know, things change in your life, such as the loss of a spouse or a divorce, and um, you decide to move on with your life with a new partner, and you want to either start a family or grow uh, your family. So egg freezing is really, really useful in all these kinds of circumstances, uh, both medical and social. So um, if we concentrate a little bit more on social egg freezing, I mean, as an idea, we see that it's very empowering. It gives women choice and freedom and equality. But at the same time, because it is a medical treatment being offered to otherwise young, healthy women, it does raise questions about safety and cost effectiveness and the relative success rates. Um, so, uh, I mean, at the moment, unfortunately, um, uh, the studies examining uh, the success rates of social egg freezing are very, very limited, and the numbers are, so far are not very reliable. That's largely because social egg freezing is quite new, uh, and it's quite difficult to collect data since most of the women who have frozen the eggs uh, may not have utilized them yet, or they might utilize them many years down the line. Uh, thankfully, we do have um, a lot of encouraging data from our experience uh, freezing donor eggs and of course freezing our patients' surplus eggs. Um, now, when we're thinking about freezing cells, freezing tissues, um, we, we will see that it, it has been quite difficult for us to do so um, because uh, the freezing process itself uh, causes cellular damage. So, I mean, it was 1953 that the first baby was born from frozen sperm. Sperm was the first... Um, um, uh, the first thing that we managed to, to freeze and thaw successfully. And it took around 30 years in order to, to be able to have the first baby born from frozen embryos. And it was 1986 that we managed to have the first baby born from frozen eggs. Um, so why is this so difficult to do? Why eggs in particular are so difficult to freeze and thaw? Now, um, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, this has been difficult because eggs are very vulnerable uh, when we retrieve them. So M2 oocytes are very fragile. And that's because they, because of their size, uh, oocytes are the biggest cell in our body. Uh, it's because of their high water content. Uh, and additionally, because of the chromosomal spindle formation. Uh, when we retrieve an M2 oocyte, all the chromosomes are aligned uh, in the middle of the cell along the cytoplasmic spindle, and that makes it um, very, very vulnerable to freezing. Um, okay, and, and that's largely because freezing is associated uh, with ice crystal formation, uh, which can be detrimental uh, to uh, a cell's uh, structure and function. Um, so in our initial attempts um, and with the introduction of cryoprotectants, uh, we started to, to, to learn how to freeze eggs, but we weren't really successful. The slow egg freezing pr process uh, only gave an average survival rate 
uh, of 61%, which means that out of the 10 eggs that we managed to freeze, only six of them would survive the process. Uh, but fortunately, as years went by and with the introduction of vitrification, uh, we managed to improve that uh, tremendously. Um, and we saw that uh, we had faster meiotic spindle recovery, improved oocyte survival, and this really reflect, was reflected in the pregnancy rates. So as the years went by, we learned how to freeze eggs and we found techniques that would allow us to do it better. Now, um, we can see that as the years went by, so, uh, the pre so did the preconceptions about egg freezing changed. So, uh, in 2010, um, uh, with a very big uh, study that was performed at the time, it was proven. It was uh, proven that there was no significant difference between using uh, in uh, where the pregnancy rates are concerned. There was no great difference uh, found between using uh, frozen thawed eggs and fresh eggs. So it confirmed the effectiveness of this new oocyte um, cryo storage uh, process. Uh, by 2013, oocyte cryo preservation was no longer uh, considered experimental. I mean, the success rates were very, very encouraging. Uh, we managed to have a very high oocyte survival rates uh, uh, between 90 and 97 percent. Um, and I will not tire you with statistics. I will just mention that the clinical pregnancy rate per transfer was 36 to 61 percent, which is amazing. Uh, but of course, we need to keep in mind that all these numbers uh, um, are from women who are quite young. So they're below the age of 30 in most of the cases. Um, now, additionally, by 2013, uh, the, the safety of the, um, cryo, the oocyte cryopreservation process was, was also uh, um, proven. Uh, more and more evidence was piling up, saying that there were no associated increases uh, where chromosomal abnormalities were concerned or birth defects or developmental defects between the use of uh, frozen, uh, vitrified thawed eggs and fresh eggs. Um, and so it was um, the, the oocyte cryopreservation process was actually offered more widely to women uh, with medical problems and, of course, um, uh, for the, uh, as part of the oocyte donation programs. Now, uh, by 2018, uh, the American Ethics Committee actually um, had more evidence in order to recommend it as ethically permissible uh, uh, to, to offer it to women uh, for social reasons uh, in order to enhance their reproductive autonomy and promote their social equality. So we've really gone a long way. So, so far we have seen that egg uh, cryopreservation um, is safe, it's effective. Uh, I mean, the freezing method that is used and the lab quality are detrimental uh, to the success rates of freezing and thawing. Uh, the duration of storage so far has not been an issue, uh, but of course, this is something that will need to be studied and investigated further, because as we said, egg freezing is quite new for social reasons, I mean. And the last thing I would like to, to talk about with you is the importance of maternal age at the time of freezing, and of course, the numbers of, the number of eggs that we keep frozen. Um, so, I mean, this a bit complicated uh, diagram, what it is trying to say is that, unfortunately, as we women uh, grow older, um, we have we see a decline in both of the quality and the quantity of our eggs. So as we're growing older, our oocytes um, do not manage to go through their cellular divisions, uh, and as a result, uh, they be they are abnormal. So if we have an abnormal egg, we have abnormal fertilization, abnormal embryo, and so. Uh, 
uh, we might not have a pregnancy or we might have an early pregnancy loss. And this is something that happens naturally with aging. Um, so um, if we really want to go ahead with egg freezing, it would be highly recommended to do so the younger we are. Uh, so if it is possible to do it before we reach the age of 35, because after 35, 37 years old, we see a very sharp decline in our egg quality. Now, additionally, since we are born with uh, a, a particular, a set number of eggs, which is um, our ovarian reserve, and this ovarian reserve is being slowly depleted through our, our reproductive life, um, it is quite important to, to proceed with the uh, a social egg freezing again when we are younger and our ovarian reserve is higher because this will allow us uh, to obtain more oocytes during uh, the stimulation cycle. And the more eggs we obtain during one stimulation cycle, the less times we will have to repeat it. Now, a very, very interesting um, research published um, in the Journal of Fertility and Sterility in 2017 is really an eye opener, as we can see that um, we can see the number of mature eggs that we need to freeze for different uh, um, age groups in order to have a high chance, again, not a guarantee, a high chance of achieving at least one live birth. And we can see, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't changed it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, this is the interesting graph. Okay. Um, and we can see here that for a woman who is 35 uh, years old, around 15 mature eggs are required in order to give her an 80% chance of having at least one live birth. Uh, if a woman is over 40, uh, um, 30 mature eggs are required in order to give her a 50% chance of having one live birth, okay? So we can see how important it is to actually freeze early, freeze younger, if we, if we would like to. So, um, is it really worth doing? I mean, is social egg freezing really worth doing? I mean, it is a revolutionary uh, idea. It is very empowering. Um, it is safe. It is effective. Uh, it can really save us from any potential consequences of having a baby later on in life. But we have to keep in mind that there might be high private treatment costs associated with it and um, that egg freezing is not a guarantee, I'm afraid. It's not a fertility insurance. Um, it doesn't 100% guarantee us that we will definitely have a life birth out uh, of the eggs that we have frozen. So um, what is very, very important when we try to approach uh, social egg freezing is to have the correct uh, counseling. Um, we should be, I mean, we should inform you about the safety, the success rates, our practice experience in freezing uh, eggs, because this is also of uh, detrimental importance. Egg freezing technically is not very easy and it requires embryology staff that they're very highly trained and skilled. Um, of course, we need to let you know of the limitations that come about with age and the fact that social egg freezing is still new as IVF in general, but social egg freezing is even newer. And of course, um, we need to have more time in order to completely um, evaluate any long-term effects. And with that, I would like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for your patience with our technical difficulties. And I hope you, you enjoyed the presentation. Brilliant as always. Thank you so much, Dr. Fatih, mm -hmm. for your presentation. And it was really interesting and you are very right with uh, the words you said. It's a revolution, revolutionary 
um, option nowadays. And of course, we are here to help you out with some of your questions. I do see that some of our patients are already um, typing the questions. So okay, are you perfect. ready to begin mm -hmm. the Q&A session? Of really? course. Thank you so much indeed. And let's have a look. Uh, the first question is ready. Can you tell me what are the chances? Low AMH, 36 year old, only managed to freeze two eggs. I feel that now this may not have a good result. Hmm. Ah, oh, this is this is unfortunately a regular practice. I mean, it's very, very rarely that we get women with excellent ovarian reserve and who come in to freeze their eggs when they're really, really young. So we are faced with these decisions all the time. Um, yes, I see that unfortunately because of the low ovarian reserve, uh, it's quite difficult to accumulate the eggs. Um, but the, the advantage uh, that you have is the age. I mean, you're very, very young. So uh, the oocyte quality at 36, it's still quite good, okay, compared to being older. So um, if you have the emotional stamina and the financial resources to support your IVF treatments, um, and I, I wouldn't be against it. I wouldn't be against it because of your age. I mean, if you can put aside two, four, six eggs, it's still a gain because of your age. It's still possible. So don't lose hope, right? It's still possible. Exactly. Exactly. The numbers are not very bad. Not a 36. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's definitely comforting. Tony, thank you so much for your first question. Um, uh, if I could just add some, sure. I mean, the, the only problem, the only problem, one of the problem with egg freezing is, is, is that unfortunately, we are, we are a little bit blind to the oocyte quality. I mean, um, if our, if Tony was to go through IVF and fertilization, um, she, she and her doctor could see straight away if your eggs are okay, if they would fertilize, if they would become blastocysts, they would do the embryo transfer and really see in a very short period of time if she has potential to achieve a pregnancy on, with her own eggs or not. With egg freezing, unfortunately, we cannot see that. And that's why we usually advise to freeze as many eggs as possible. If you're around or below the, the age of 35, the gold number is 10. If you can store 15, perfect. And that's, you know, to keep it a little bit safe because they might be enough, but if there is a case that they might not. So we are trying to improve our chances by storing more eggs. In reality, you might not need as many, but because you don't know, uh, you have to go through this process of, of storing as many as possible and as many as you can really, if you have restraints such as low ovarian reserve. Yep, definitely. Totally agreed. And of course, thank you so much, Tony, for your question. And Dr. Fatini, as always, thank you for your answer to that. Um, okay, let's have a look. Um, the next question is for uh, from other patient. I am 50. I did three IVFs, two at the age of 48, one at the age of 50. My STEM protocol was always 300 units gonal F for nine or 10 days, adding cetro. Mm -hmm. at day seven trigger with gonapeptil number of collected oocytes from seven to 22 mature from three to nine fertilized three to seven embryos frozen at day three nine embryos two of them i don't see the next part so if you can perhaps add it but i think we can still uh well yeah. first of all I uh, will have to say that I'm amazed <laughs> of having so many eggs at the age of 50. Is this a typing error or is it really 50? I'm really surprised. Okay. Let's okay, have a look. Right? If you can uh, add some uh, information, well, no, that'll be great. Someone is typing. I believe that's, that's what we... Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's have a look. Okay. Sorry. Just give me a second. I need to select that and let's see. There's a... Yeah, sorry, two of them tested normal, but didn't implant. Okay, now my new clinic wants me to take really high doses of simulation medicine, starting 375 units of gonol, mm -hmm. and at day four, 300 units gonol. Uh, yeah, and 150 men of menopause. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I mean, the only thing that um, concerns me is uh, the age. I mean, at the age of 50, even if we do have a good ovarian reserve and we produce eggs, 50, amazing. <laughs> it's really amazing. I mean, you are probably women such as yourself who do maintain a good ovarian reserve. Um, maybe they are one of the few cases that we might decide to go ahead with a stimulation cycle over the age of 45. Um, however, I, I'm, I'm very, very surprised with the results. I'm very, very surprised that you had two euploid blastocysts at the age of 50. I think this must be some kind of a record. Um, now, as about the doses, I don't think this is your problem. I mean, through studies, it has been shown that even higher doses are not going to give us a better result. And I don't think that your problem is uh, the number of full sites that are being retrieved. With the, the dosages that you are taking, you have a very good um, response. Um, and I, I guess the, the result is... I mean, you have a lot of eggs being retrieved, but fewer embryos cultured and even fewer embryos found normal. It's because of the age. So I don't think changing the dosages is going to change something dramatically. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, One more thing here. Sorry. Um, Some information about FSH 7, my MH is 4, LH 5.8. The same uh, patient, of course, sorry. Uh, four in nanogram per ml, I guess. If yeah, we if can... you can confirm that, yeah. please yeah. let us know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's this right. is amazing. I don't think I've seen ever a patient with such a good day. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, okay, I have PCO. Uh, sorry, I have PCOS. PCOS. Um, I mean, the, the hormonal levels are fine. The AMH is fantastic. Okay, so no problems there. Um, I guess if you did manage to get euploid embryos out of your stem cycles, maybe it would be worthwhile looking into other reasons for failing to impl- uh, for that could cause implantation failure. Maybe look into the, the uterus, maybe have a hysteroscopy to see if there is an abnormality there impeding implantation, if there are any immunological factors or thrombophilia um, or any health problems that could affect um, the chances of uh, getting pregnant. I can't see any serious problem in the hormonal profile that you showed us. Okay. Um, Yeah, so the embers were only fish tested. But there was information that uh, Polona wants to do the PGTA, I believe. Um, okay, I so maybe it it wasn't Sorry, just... a, a complete um, examination of the embryos wasn't done. So in that case, it could be highly likely yes. that, that they weren't really, I mean, as far as we can check, they weren't euploid. It could be the case. And it actually makes sense. Uh, mm-hmm. Because unfortunately, at the age of 50, it's very highly unlikely that we will get a euploid embryos, I'm afraid. Okay. Someone is typing. I just want to see. Yeah. Of course, there's a thank you from uh, from Polona. Thank you so much for your questions, follow-ups as well, of course. I hope that helped. Um, and let's have a look. We have another question here from Emma. Short one. Are there any side effects of the injections? Uh, this is a very common question. Um, most of the women are really worried that they're going to get cancer by doing these injections. Um, I have to say that this preconception is largely because, um, you know, in, at the beginning of IVF, um, the studies that were formulated, they and studying, you know, the, the incidence of various types of cancers, they were done on women who were doing IVF. And of course, these women were infertile. So I guess um, it was initially these higher incidences of cancers that were initially attributed to the medication. But unfortunately, the real factor behind it was infertility. So the medication being used is safe. It doesn't cause cancer. Okay. Now, it is a whole different thing if a woman has a predisposition to develop cancer and especially an estrogen 
uh, sort of driven cancer, but the medication itself do not cause it. Now, uh, the new protocols um, use lower doses. Uh, they're only for 10 days. Uh, it's not for a very, you know, long, long periods of time. And I mean, uh, the same medication are being used uh, in women who have got cancer. They have been diagnosed with cancer, uh, even estrogen receptor cancer. And because they're going through this, um, the, the preservation of their fertility, they undergo the same treatment, more or less, without actually having um, an effect uh, in their prognosis. Okay. okay. Uh, so um, they are safe. Um, the, the major side effect or the major complication of ovarian stimulation is um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Um, but of course, nowadays, with the use of the classical antagonist, uh, the use of Arvacap for triggering, and of course, the vitrification of the embryos, uh, not doing fresh embryo transfers, we have dramatically reduced the incidence of it. So very, very rarely a woman, a woman will have to be hospitalized and treated for the, ver the very severe complications of OHSS. Um, and um, a, a mild hyperstimulation is, it can happen, uh, but it can be uh, treated very, very effectively as an outpatient. Um, now, uh, concerning any other side effects, I guess the most common side effects of these medications are mostly related to estrogens. So you might find um, having some um, breast sort of uh, discomfort or having increased vaginal discharge, um, maybe some emotional, um, how can I say, upset. Some women might become a bit more emotional. Some may be, become a bit more edgy. Um, mm -hmm. But more or less, most of the women uh, can accommodate, um, uh, they do very, very well with the injections. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma, for your okay. question. Definitely useful and important to, to remember about, yeah? So nothing to, to be scared about, for sure. Thank you so much indeed. Um, let's have a look. Emma has one more question. So how, la how long is the entire process of like freezing at your clinic? How long does it take? Yeah, for, for a Okay, okay. I mean, everything, okay, there, there has to be some workup before we start the cycle, as I mentioned before, but as soon as we have our protocol, you have purchased the medication, we're just waiting for your period to come. So everything starts on the second day of the period. Uh, the stimulation protocol itself lasts for 10 to 12 days. Uh, there is some variability according to your, the, the length of your cycle. Uh, but and it is completed um, within 12 to 14 days. Uh, we freeze the eggs, and that's basically it. Uh, after the oocyte pickup, after around 14 days from the oocyte pickup, you will get your period, and this whole process will have been completed. Your next cycle will start normally, and you'll go on uh, with your normal day life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, thank you so much for your question. And let's have a look. We have another question, probably our final one. So if you have mm -hmm. more, go ahead, type those in. We are still here for you. We are here to take any questions you might have. So let's have a look, okay? I'm 52 going through treatment. I have been prescribed prednisolone. Are there any side effects? I'm using Domino X. Okay. I mean, um, every clinic has got its own protocol when it comes to endometrial preparation cycles. Um, I have to say that we use it as well, especially after the start uh, of the progesterone preparation. And uh, we, um, we usually use it at low doses, around 8 to 10 milligram. I don't know how much you're taking. Um, usually low doses, um, th they do not cause any serious side effects. Of course, you need to be careful uh, with um, the consumption of salty food or a very sweet food while you're taking your cortisone. Um, and it's um, in a way we prescribe it in order to, um, to bring about um, a milder immune response from the body. So... Uh, it is something that seems to help with implantation. Uh, we usually start it, as I said before, when we start the progesterone preparation, either 
progesterone or prolytex injections. And we usually carry it on throughout the first part of pregnancy. And we start to wean off at around the ninth week of pregnancy. Yeah, perfect. As you uh, can 10 see. milligrams. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's good. <laughs> Thank you so Sorry, much. No problems there. Uh, one more question. In the meantime, we did receive. So my clinic prescribed me 150 gonal F plus 150 Mary of Fert plus Progevera, Progevera, 10 milligrams, but starting from day three cycle, not two. Not, the not day two. Not day two, um, yeah. Yes, I mean, we usually start on day three. I usually start my patients on day three. Uh, but uh, if there is some, you know, timing difficulties, or scheduling difficulties, most of the times it's really not a problem to even start on day three. I mean, the sooner you start, the greater the recruitment of the oocytes is. So we usually want to start early um, instead of later on. But okay, day three, I, I feel it's still acceptable. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Simon. Well, I hope that helped again. Uh, thank you so much. And I believe so. Thanks a lot then. Don't worry. Um, and of course, uh, as I've mentioned, probably our final question. But of course, if you have any, you can still type this in. But also remember, you can get in touch with Assisting Nature's team. And I'm sure that they will be happy to help you with any questions of uh, you might have, of course, on this particular topic on egg freezing, but also on other topics. I'm sure of this. Uh, this is not our first webinar with Dr. Fotinini and her team at Assisting Nature. And I'm always looking forward to have some more events. It's always interesting and it's always uh, thorough for sure. Um, there's someone is typing. So, oh, sorry, Tony. I think I've missed it. But of course, it's going to be recorded. That means you will be able to rewatch this. And of course, the uh, slides will be also shown there so don't worry okay you will see it you you are able when it's recorded you can actually stop it and you can have a look so don't worry i'm sure it's going to be there um so yeah um i think we will be finishing for today but thank you so much everyone for joining for your patience we are very sorry for you know for uh, for making this late yes, but this is like out of our hands sometimes uh, but we were able to be here we are able to help you out i'm sure so thanks you thank you for uh, joining and thank you for your questions as always dr fatini anything else you would like to add no it's been a pleasure uh, i really enjoyed this webinar so i really love sharing information uh with uh, our women and couples out there and of course if they have any further questions uh I'm always available to answer them. Brilliant. I'm glad we do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, again, it's always a great, uh, great pleasure to have you. Remember, we will be back. There are some more events coming up. Next week, we will talk about PGTA, some success stories. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, it will be on Wednesday at 6 p.m. UK time. So I hope you will be able to join us. And of course, you can register already on our website. Dr. Fotini Shuliero was our uh, presenter tonight. We discussed freezing your eggs and when to do that. And I believe we know the answer for this question already. Dr. Fotini, a pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Also Thank for you your Carolina. patience, <laughs> but I'm glad we were able to pull this we up. Managed. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and that's what matters. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to some more webinars with you as always. Thank Me you too. indeed, everyone as well. Take care. You. Enjoy your thank evening. You. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.